Hello out there in television land. Welcome to It's Your Health, the fastest 30 minutes in television land history. Philip Enyo with my bride, who will uh, give me advice along the way. <laughs> you sounded there for a minute like you didn't know what show we were on. You, you hesitated. <laughs> right. I, I wondered if we were doing a different show than what I planned for. No, it is It's Your Health, and make sure you check with your health care provider before doing any of the things that we talk about here on each Oh, absolutely. All right, we'll be right back after this brief commercial message. Remember, you're watching It's Your Health, your leader in healthcare information. Welcome back to the first edition of It's Your Health, which reminds me, uh, do you know why God made man first instead of woman? I'm going to be sorry I asked. <laughs> he didn't want any advice, okay? <laughs> That's why. <laughs> but be that as it may, why don't we start? <laughs> I don't know. Why don't we? <laughs> My Let's go to goodness. headlines. Headlines. And let's give some good advice. There you go. Aspirin for cardiovascular disease prevention. The myriad of available guidelines addressing aspirin therapy has led to confusion in prescribing or recommending it. Well, to me, it's almost kind of a, a no-brainer. I, I think if you're uh, at a certain age, you should take a, a baby aspirin, 81 milligrams, enteric-coated every day, especially if you have heart disease, diabetes, uh, previous stroke, uh, heart attack, things along those lines. There's an interesting concept, however, called aspirin resistance, which can sometimes show up on some uh, blood work. And uh, it is controversial because you're asking someone to take a medication that could possibly uh, give you an ulcer. But, but by and large, we're underdosing our use of aspirin. Check with your healthcare provider. You should probably be on it. So that's a really old medicine, but it still has all the oomph you need. Yes, it, it knocks out these things called platelets, which make the blood sticky and uh, can certainly reduce your risk of uh, stroke and heart attack. So I'd really be on it. So what if you're taking something like Crestor or something like that? Should you still take it? Yes, you probably should. You probably should. Okay, next headline. Probiotics for the prevention of antibiotic-associated diarrhea and clostridium difficile? Difficile? Difficile. difficile. Yeah, we say C. diff in our line of work. C so. <laughs> we say C. diff. <laughs> so, uh, big problem because uh, patients who are ill get powerful antibiotics and they end up getting antibiotic-induced diarrhea, of which the C. diff is a bad infection. But nevertheless, uh, people take these probiotics thinking that they can prevent antibiotic-induced diarrhea. And some people take probiotics anytime, anyway. And I'm not so sure I'm a fan of these. This what? article pretty much... What are probiotics? Probiotics are kind of like a vitamin that has good bacteria in it. And uh, we're already uh, putting into a salt your... Uh, good bacteria in your bowel because of the, your illness and because of your antibiotics. And so why introduce a foreign bacteria as a probiotic? That's basically what it is. I'm not so sure it's a good idea. This article pretty much says the same thing. Uh, there's very limited use, and I'm not so sure probiotics uh, are out there and are a good thing for you. Why introduce a foreign bacteria uh, to you that you... That's Don't interesting eat. because they're very popular right they're, now. They're popular. It's a fad thing. And I'm not so sure it's a good thing. Okay. Are you ready for another headline? Yes. <laughs> okay. Give us more advice. <laughs> Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for fibromyalgia. Boy, is that a mouthful. Would a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, an SSRI, improve worsening fatigue, pain, and depression in patients with fibromyalgia? Uh, the answer is yes. The serotonin drugs, Prozac, Celexa, Zoloft, uh, all will help to elevate your brain chemistry, serotonin levels. And believe it or not, uh, as the commercial says, where is, you know, where is your pain? How do you feel it? Uh, depressive patients have more pain as a rule. And so fibromyalgia is a chronic painful condition. Uh, we find the use of these medications, sometimes even Cymbalta is actually indicated for something like that, uh, will make you feel better and reduce your pain. 
Okay, well that's something worth checking into with your doctor. Better living through chemistry, right? Right. Speaking of better living, we're going to give you a, a video test now. Oh, okay. You see before you a, a photograph of a woman's hands and what's causing her painful, itchy, fissured fingers and palms? What's making her feel that way? Right, that's a good question. We see this particularly in the colder weather. We see this in patients who, uh, like nurses, are washing their hands a lot, surgeons who are, you know, washing them with iodine, uh, construction workers who are in uh, uh, chemical issues with their hands. And it, it actually is a form of eczema where you get these dry, cracked, fissured, fingers and palms and it's painful uh, can lead to infection it looks painful uh, usually uh, trying to get rid of the offending agent is the uh, treatment of choice if you can find out what's doing it and avoid it uh, but usually a good moisturizer uh, a couple times a day will help uh, to uh, get rid of this uh, this is like something a, that simple something that simple believe it or not these these hands are you know our hands are not the uh, the hood on a car. They're not designed for extremes in uh, temperature or chemicals and they are reacting in some patients to, uh, to that. So uh, just a good wax job for your, for your hands is all you need. Oh, okay. I'll remember that. Hmm. This looks familiar. Vitamin D deficiency. Is there really a pandemic? In recent years, numerous clinical research articles have concluded that large proportions of North Americans and global populations are deficient in vitamin D. Do you agree? It was an epidemic years ago. Anyone who we measured vitamin D levels were low, and we gave them supplements. Uh, and the study suggests that perhaps our measuring the level of vitamin D was an error to begin with and these people may not have been as vitamin D deficient as we thought. So uh, it's complicated by the fact that sometimes insurance companies now will not allow us to check for vitamin D levels without issuing a bill. So uh, I, I kind of think a middle of the road approach is, is, is warranted. I think we're vitamin D deficient if you live in the northern states and you ought to be on a supplement perhaps a thousand units every day. Uh, what could it hurt? Could it? Well, too much vitamin D is no good. Uh, it is a fat-soluble vitamin and can accumulate, uh, particularly in the, in the liver. And in that case, you might need a test to see that you're... Uh, but somebody like yourself mm -hmm. who uh, is at risk for osteoporosis, you need your vitamin D. Okay. When and how to offer help when can I tell that someone needs help for depression? Well, what do you think? Well, there's a lot of ways. Um, mood changes. They go from being up to being sad. Emotional changes from angry to, sa to sad. Um, they stop taking care of themselves. They stop grooming themselves. Uh, they lose interest in the things that they used to have interest in. They don't take care of their house, but we won't talk about people who do that. <laughs> she must that's, be depressed. <laughs> that's another story. And, and it's stuff that's lingering. It's not something that somebody's sad or depressed for a day. They've been that way for weeks. Right. And that's how, how you determine that, you know, that this is what's going on. Yeah, usually the person who is depressed won't recognize it. Uh, others will, and they need to bring that to the uh, health care provider's attention uh, or talk to the family member to get help. Uh, most people don't come in and, and say they're depressed. Uh, other people will tell them. And it is a, a risky time of the year. We're getting into the uh, holiday season. It's getting colder. It's darker earlier, darker longer. Uh, that in itself can lend itself to uh, depressive symptoms. But there's great help out there. Most depressions are uh, easily treated and self-limited. Uh, the main thing is to assess that they're not someone who wants to hurt themselves or others, and you need to ask that question and get help immediately if that's the case. So at that point, we're going to stop what we're doing and continue on after this brief commercial message because I'm sure you have a lot more good advice to share with us. <laughs> oh my God made man first. Don't forget that. We'll be right back. 
Remember, you're watching It's Your Health, your leader in healthcare information. Welcome back to It's Your Health, and we are here to offer suggestions and advice, whatever it is <laughs> that you may need. She won't let it go. Need. She's like a dog on a bone. And our I'm last, um, excuse me. All righty. In our last segment, we were speaking about people who are feeling depressed or sad, and we had a very vitriolic election recently, and people took sides strongly one way or the other. And the election was close. The uh, popular vote was not the same as the Electoral College. And there's a lot of anger and there's a lot of frustration. And in that, you've got to watch if people are dialing that down or if they're staying that way, because that could be a sign of depression on their part. Yeah, no doubt. And even amongst family members, I think uh, there were food fights. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, there were red states and there are blue states. And um, I'm old school and I'm sorry. I think we're all red, white and blue. And uh, let's move on, okay? And let's row the boat in the same direction. It's not like I can move to another country or another planet. Uh, let's just work with what we got and uh, try to be the best. Speaking of moving to another planet, that new show that's on National Geographic called Mars, people going to live on Mars, that's really interesting. That is really interesting. You slept through it. <laughs> is that right? Yes. I have sleep apnea. He remember? does have <laughs> sleep apnea, trust me. Okay, let's do some headlines. Substance use predicts brain illness. Concurrent chronic use of cigarettes, alcohol, and marijuana is significantly linked with having a major depressive episode. Yeah, these chemicals uh, do induce uh, actual structural brain changes and changes in brain chemistry. Uh, of particular alarm is the use of marijuana in an adolescent brain. It, uh, without question, uh, the studies have shown that it mm -hmm. uh, changes brain chemistry and uh, changes brain uh, architecture, lowers IQ, and th these are permanent things. And uh, why the country wants to uh, legalize marijuana and expose our adolescents to this is beyond me. I think it's uh, fraught with danger, and I'm sorry, it's, it's an old school kind of thing. Uh, I think and as an adult, if you want to do this, fine, but don't expose your kids to these things. Maybe that's the idea of making it legalized, you know, that it's right now anybody can get it. But if you legalize it and you put limits and laws with it, then maybe you'll, you'll limit the number of younger children that can get it. Well, if, if alcohol is any indication, it's not going to work. Okay, well, let's go on to the next headline because this one is great. <laughs> I just love this headline. Minnesota woman is allergic to her husband. For the past year, a Minnesota woman has lived in the confines of her bedroom, away from her husband, because the plastic wrapped room is the safest place for her to be. Now, how many women watching this show <laughs> are saying, aha, now I know what's been wrong with me all this time. This is a real uh, medical case report of a woman who has a uh, documented allergy uh, to her husband. Her body puts out uh, a certain amount of uh, allergic cells and uh, this causes a syndrome of itchiness, uh, sore throat, tightness in the chest and avoidance is the only cure. So, <laughs> And so they're still married. That's the surprising part. Uh, well, I don't know. There are acquired allergies as we know so maybe uh, that uh, that can happen to almost anyone. Can you? Ooh. Uh, can you lose an allergy? Uh, can you outgrow an allergy? Uh, it, yes, some people do, yes. I don't know particularly about this one, but uh, I'm not sure. For, the divorce attorneys will have a good uh, field day with this, I'm sure. <laughs> Allergic now, to your spouse. This next headline is one that I know of all the things that you believe in, you agree with this one very much. 90% of Americans have prayed 
for healing. When Americans experience health problems, they don't just rely on doctors and medications. A new study found that most Americans have turned to prayer to heal themselves or to heal others. No doubt there, there is a power of prayer and uh, people who tap into that spirituality uh, will generally do better uh, overall. And I read a report once where uh, uh, in Ireland uh, they would say the rosary and uh, the rosary with part of its repetition and meditation uh, actually had tremendous uh, healing powers. And uh, even as a family growing up, we used to uh, say the family rosary every night. That's hard to believe, uh, but that was uh, part, of, uh, part of our daily fabric and, and life. And it, uh, again, is old school, and uh, old school worked. Maybe we need to get back to some of that. I think you hit on something important when you use the word meditation, because prayer is something like meditation. It's quiet, it's personal. Um, you block out the rest of the world, and I think all of that plays a part. No doubt, no doubt. Okay, now we'll go into some very specific problems that mostly women have. Symptoms of a yeast infection. Anyone who's had a yeast infection knows the unbearable itching it can bring, excruciating, almost painful, nearly constant sensation until it's treated. Well, we see that very often uh, in our women who have diabetes, for example. Uh, perhaps they were recently on antibiotics and have burning, itching, uh, maybe a discharge, and uh, very uncomfortable, uh, especially during the summer months, let's face it. So uh, easily treated, and uh, you just need to get on top of it. But keep in mind that the yeast infection, especially if they're recurrent, may be a sign of another condition for which you have, maybe you ought to see your gynecologist, maybe you ought to get a blood test, maybe you have diabetes and you don't know it, so. And can men get the yeast infection? Yeah, they can, especially if they're having intimate relations uh, with a woman. They can get uh, symptoms of a yeast infection on themselves, maybe about uh, 15, 20 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. The next one we have some uh, information uh, for our vi viewers to look at while you explain about ADHD and problems that could mean you as an adult have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, although we always only talk about that in relation to children. Yeah, get a load of this screen. It'll show you uh, some of the 10 problems that could mean it. Trouble getting organized. Uh, reckless driving and uh, traffic accidents, marital troubles, uh, distractibility, uh, poor listening skills, uh, restlessness, trouble relaxing, uh, trouble starting a task, uh, being late because you're often distracted uh, and uh, so lateness is something that we see, angry outbursts and having trouble uh, prioritizing issues in your lives. So, uh, I mean, this kind of covers a, a wide range of things, and if you have an adult out there who has these issues, maybe you ought to uh, get them some help, because uh, these children who have ADHD do grow up into adults and have adult symptoms. And sometimes we don't catch it. Exactly, exactly. So uh, bring that to your... Uh, attention to your health care provider and maybe you can get some treatment for um, it. I think my husband has ADHD. <laughs> um, I'm bringing it to your attention. Is that right? Why? Because I'm always late? Is that the issue? <laughs> well, or, uh... I, won't, I won't go into that. We'll let that for another time. <laughs> <laughs> well, just in time we're taking a break. Yes, and we do have lots more to tell you when we come back to you on the other side of this important information. That's right. You're watching It's Your Health. Your leader in healthcare information will be right back. Welcome back to the final section <laughs> of It's Your Health. And I want to just take a moment, although we're a little bit late for Veterans Day, it's never too late to thank all the fine men and women who work so hard to keep our freedom for us who work now or have served in the past, we offer you our sincere gratitude. 
Yeah, there's no doubt we wouldn't be where we are as a nation, and uh, freedom is not free. That's for sure. I read somewhere where the, a flag doesn't fly because of the wind. It flies because of all the last breaths of the soldiers. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's moving. Well, let's move on to our headlines because that's what people want to hear about. Uh, menopause and a decline in intimacy. And it says here, you are not allowed to comment on this. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, no, it doesn't say that. Women might say, not tonight, dear, a lot more often in the year and a half before their final period. Sexual declines typically starts 20 months before a woman's final period and continues for several years after it ends. Is this where I say I'm a client or not? <laughs> Somehow I remember something along these lines. But of course, let's face it, uh, change of life is something which is not an on and off kind of switch. It's a, something that you kind of slide or grow into. So as you're getting into menopause, naturally the estrogen levels are going to decline. And as the estrogen levels decline, so may uh, intimacy and things along those lines. So you work at it a little bit harder. You make more of an effort. Oh, is that, is that what I should have done? All right. <laughs> Note Too to late. self. <laughs> Too late now. When I build my time machine, I know what I'm going to do next time. Oh, right. boy. Not very funny, you know. <laughs> okay. You're putting yourself into the doghouse here. All right. <laughs> Speaking of doghouse, this is a concern for anybody who has a dog. Treats may pose hidden danger to dogs. It's called xylitol. It begins with the letter X and looks for it on most of your low sugar chewing gum, especially. Between Halloween and the holidays, treats are here. But if those treats contain xylitol, a sugar substitute found in sugar-free gum, mints, candy, and even baked goods, they can be deadly to dogs. Their metabolism, I guess, just can't handle it. And uh, so uh, that, and there's a bunch of other things that dogs can get sick on. Yeah, right? we, we know that there are things that dogs shouldn't have, like chocolate and things like that. Um, but this is one that's kind of a hidden danger. And what happens is there's a massive release of insulin that the dog can't handle and it, it becomes life-threatening to them. So put your gum out of reach of your dog because I'm sure it smells really good to them. Yeah, and they somehow have a way of finding these things. Yes, especially one of ours in particular. Ready? I'm ready. Were you born ready? <laughs> no. no, I wasn't. Oh, okay. <laughs> What to believe and do about statin-associated adverse effects? Well, uh, statins, uh, I think most of us should consider being on them, believe it or not, in today's society. Now, we, be specific and tell us what statins are. Okay, statins are cholesterol-lowering medicines, Lipitor, Zocor, uh, Crestor, okay. and uh, they inhibit the liver from uh, making cholesterol. And in doing so, we like to think it would reduce stroke and heart attack risks. Uh, most of us out there have uh, abnormal lipid profiles and are at risk for stroke or heart attack, especially of hypertension, and it runs in your family. Uh, statins will reduce that risk, but many patients do not want to take a statin because of perceived uh, side effects. And a lot of the side effects are real. Some of them really aren't. Uh, they, they talk about muscle aches and pains as the big one. And uh, in all honesty, when we measure uh, muscle enzymes, they really don't go up that high in patients who have muscle legs and cramps. Although it is a known uh, side effect, and you can run into a statin-induced myopathy, which can clog your kidneys and be very serious. We don't see that very often. And so I, I, I get concerned when patients who have abnormal lipid profiles uh, refuse to take a statin. Uh, I guess it's their right, but in, I, I really think that they're uh, not making the correct decision for them. I really do. Um, and I'll tell you why. Because we have patients who have, say, carotid stenosis. They have blockages in their neck. 
We can document that with an ultrasound. We put them on a statin and do nothing else. Wait a year and we repeat the ultrasound and these plaques will recede. They'll get smaller. Wow. In, a lot of, in a lot of patients, if you can drive the LDL, the bad cholesterol, down low enough, you'll actually get regression of disease. I mean, why not? Why well, not? I know that when my sister started on them, she had a lot of muscle aches and pains and she said to me, whatever you do, don't take them. Um, and of course I didn't listen and I took them anyway, but I had no residual side effects at all. And some are more uh, side effect generating than others. And sometimes if you can just find a statin uh, that you can tolerate, you, you'll, you'll be better off than not. It's just something that uh, is a stone in my shoe and I, I think we really need to be more proactive uh, because most people aren't going to do the other stuff like diet, exercise, lose weight and stop smoking. So what else can we do? So. Uh, even in the patient with the carotid stenosis, they did nothing else. They still kept their other lifestyles, but they had regression of disease and uh, signed me up. Here's something that, it's not one of our headlines, but it sounds something that we should talk about. Heart rhythm disorder may be tied to a range of ills. Atrial fibrillation, a common type of heart rhythm disorder, is associated with a wider range of conditions than previously believed. Findings add to the growing literature on the association between AFib and cardiovascular outcomes beyond stroke. Right. Well, our heart is normally in a sinus rhythm. That means it beats regularly. Atrial fibrillation is irregular uh, and can be chronic, although sometimes you can get placed back into a normal rhythm, either with medications or shocking. But nevertheless, if you have atrial fibrillation, you're at risk for heart disease, stroke, heart attack, kidney disease. Uh, sometimes the side effects of treating this with anticoagulation, you can get bleeding disorders as well. Uh, a lot of uh, atrial fibrillation, when I look back on it, it has to do with people who drink a lot. We hmm. call it holiday heart. And so uh, you may wanna, if you're using alcohol out there on a daily basis, uh, dial it back, if not uh, get rid of it entirely. Uh, although I can't say it is the cause, it's one of the interesting causes uh, of atrial fibrillation. But speaking of fast heart rates, uh, look how fast we go here in our uh, doing the It's Your Health. It is the fastest 30 minutes in television history out there in television land. And this is a hard time to tell people to cut back on alcohol with the holiday season upon us. Exactly, exactly. But now Now's the time to do it today. Don't wait and say, I'll do it after the holidays or I'll start a New Year resolution. Yeah, start now. Thank you for allowing us to come into your home and inform you and hopefully entertain you with good advice, right? <laughs> oh, impeccable advice. <laughs> well, thank you again. Happy holidays and enjoy the holiday season. And we'll see you real soon.